grammatically incorrect, but theologically unimpeachable. Done made my vow to the Lord. Brother Jim Ernest, good to see you. Raise your hand, Brother Ernest, good to see you. God bless you, sir. When I last saw this brother, he was in the hospital for major surgery. And now you look better than the rest of us, sir. Good to see you. God bless you. God bless you. Let us pray. Our ancestors made a vow to you that they would not turn back. Harriet Tubman made a vow to you that she would not turn back. Nat Turner made a vow to you that he would not turn back. Who are we in this age with a marionette of a president dangled on strings of evil by the empire's puppet master? Who are we to let him cause us to turn back? Who are we to allow any kind of affliction or challenge to turn us back? We ancestrally have made a vow to you and we will not turn back. No matter the challenge, we will go together as your people, no matter where we are from or what we look like. We are your people dedicated to your salvation. You're making things whole and right and healthy in this world. And so now it has fallen to your servant to speak. Speak in spite of me that our collective hunger might meet with the bread of life. In your name we do pray and ask it all. Let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Beloved, I want to direct your attention to Genesis, the first chapter. I'll be reading verses 1 and 2. The word Genesis means the book of beginnings. It is the book of beginnings. Now, if you cannot find Genesis, please meet with me privately after worship. And after I shall have cried at my miserable, abject failure as a pastor, we will figure out a remedial course of action. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. I'm not even going to say when you have it, say amen. I mean, you ought to already be there. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void. And darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind, a wind from God swept over, hovered over the face of the waters. This morning, I want to talk about hovering, hovering. Is there, is there anything more majestic than an eagle in flight? Is there anything more magnificent? Is there anything more magisterial than an eagle spreading her wings in flight, dancing through the heavens. I have a question for you. Have you ever seen an eagle in flight? Raise your hand if you've seen. Now, I'm not talking about Animal Planet. I'm not talking about Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I mean, with your own two eyes, which God has given you, have you ever seen an eagle in flight? It was the great Clarence LaVon Franklin, C.L. Franklin, the father of Aretha Franklin, who preached his sermon, The Eagle Stirreth Her Nest, reminding us of the power of the eagle and juxtaposing the flight and behavior 
of the eagle with the flight and behavior of chickens. Eagles soar in the air alone and chickens scratch on the ground in groups. Eagles soar in the air alone and chickens scratch on the ground in groups. Eagles can fly away with prey that weigh more than they do. I've not seen this with my own eyes. I saw this on the animal planet, an eagle flying off with an animal that weighed two to three times what the eagle herself weighed. When an eagle leaves the ground, she flaps her wings, and the flapping motion causes air to flow faster over the top of her wings, and she begins to rise seemingly effortlessly, graciously soaring into the highest of the heavens. Pound for pound, the wing of an eagle is stronger than the wing of an airplane. Pound for pound, an eagle's wing is stronger than an airplane's wing. And this was interesting because I was thinking about this text and this sermon. I need you all to know people say, when do preachers write sermons? We never stop writing sermons. We never stop thinking about what we need say to give God's word purchase in the present moment. We never stop. And as I was thinking, I was on a flight on Friday afternoon from Indianapolis to Washington, D.C., and I sat above the wing. Anybody ever sat above the wing in the airplane? And I, I lifted up the shade and I looked out on the wing and I saw the metal that had been bent and I saw the rivets that had been placed to hold all of the sheets where they needed to be held. As a matter of fact, Brother Marvin Long, a member of our congregation who worships at, uh, worships at eight, told me he was one of the riveters who helped to hold in place the precious metal that allows planes to fly. I have prayed multiple times on an airplane, Lord, I hope this wing does not let us die. Because if that wing fails, I am no more. You can have engines that work, but if the wings fail, there is no hope. You can have a pilot who has logged hundreds of thousands of miles in the air, but without wings, there is no hope. You can have things coming down from the ceiling that you put on your face before you put on somebody else's face, but if there are no wings, it is all for naught. This airplane that had me land safely at DCA at 7.15 on Friday evening had wings strong enough to bring back about 100 people from Indianapolis to Washington, D.C., but the wings of that plane are not as strong as the wings of an eagle. The writer in Deuteronomy tells us that the eagle hovers over her young, protecting them, flies over her young, feeding them and keeping them from danger. And what the writer of Deuteronomy is trying to get us to see is that that eagle is a metaphorical representation of who God is in our lives. Our God is a God with strong wings. Our God is a God who lands us safely in the midst of turmoil and danger. Our God is a God who protects us and feeds us while soaring across all difficulty and all chaos. It was the Afro-Asiatic Hebrews, according to one scholar that I consulted, who borrowed this language from Egyptian. The Egyptians used this language to describe a winged goddess in their panoply of the divine. There was a goddess of multiple wings who cared for the people of God. And when the Hebrews heard their cousins using that language, they said, no, not only does that apply to your goddess, that applies to our God. I wonder if there's anyone here who's been in a situation and you know that it was the flapping of God's wings that kept you. 
Has anybody here ever been in a hospital room and you felt the backdraft of God's flapping wings? Anybody here ever been in economic turmoil, relationship turmoil, depression, emotional distress, and you felt a wind at your back and before you it was the flapping of God's wings? I've pastored you all, and I know some of your stories. Colonel Johnny Hollis was a steward over at Turner when I served. I'm so glad to see him. He has had much tragedy in his life, but he keeps on going because he's felt the backdraft of God's wings. There are those of you here today who have buried sons and daughters. You have gone through chemotherapy and all kinds of difficulties, but you kept on going because you felt God flapping God's wings and giving you what was necessary when you had no energy of your own. I came to tell you this morning, if you felt some wind across your face when you were lying on your bed, God was protecting you all day and all night. I came to tell you that while you set over your oatmeal and your raisin bran and your Captain Crunch and your Cinnamon Toast Crunch, that God was around floating with God's wings. Anybody here got new opportunities you never dreamed of? Doors and windows opening that you never imagined. Genesis says that the cosmos was created when a spirit, a ruach from God, began to hover over the waters. Genesis says that we were created when that same wind or breath was blown into us. We became living souls. Can I tell you the reason that I can put one foot in front of the other is because God's wind is not only around me, but God's wind is inside of me. That every time I breathe in and breathe out, it's God's wind. It was the Babylonians who had a different understanding of creation. We had to read in seminary, Sister Diane Ream, the Anuma Elish. I couldn't pronounce it then, and I'm probably mispronouncing it now. But it was the Babylonian account of creation. And our Old Testament Hebrew Bible professor, the great Jack Levison, said, Now, in order for you to understand the genius of the Hebrew account of creation, you got to read it against the Enuma Elish because their story is that the world was created because gods were at war with one another. And out of the blood and the chaos, that is where humanity and the created order originated. But the Hebrews said, this is not the God that we know. My God doesn't have to fight with any other God in order to create what it is that God wants to create. And I'm glad today that we serve a God who is not about war. And you need to be careful now. For those who blow the trumpets of war, you must always ask the question, who is their God? Because a God of war produces warriors, but a God of peace produces peace. That's why when I hear the foreign policy emanating from the house down the street, I'm clear who their God is. But when I come here and we worship the one who is Prince of Peace and Lord of Lords, I know that I'm serving a different God. The question is, if God is a God who hovers, a God who broods, a God from whom a spirit is released that makes things happen, is that spirit always at work? Is that spirit always on the job or in the midst of the deepest brokenness of human stories and in human history? Did God's spirit go on vacation? Where was God's spirit in 1963? A Sunday just like this when Addie Mae Collins, born on April 18, 1949, Cynthia Wesley, 
born April 30th, 1949. Carol Robertson, born April 24th, 1949. Carol Denise McNair, born November 17th, 1951. Where was God's spirit over the 16th Street Baptist Church? Was God hovering over that church when those little girls were studying about the love of Jesus in the basement of that church? And whenever I read this, I take it personally because my mama was born on June 25th, 1950. And if she had been in Birmingham at 16th Street Baptist Church instead of in Macon, Georgia at the First Baptist Church, that could have been my mama that they killed. So the question is, as the Spirit of God hovered in the pri over the primordial waters, is the Spirit still hovering? Was the Spirit hovering? In 1963, I have a contention I want us to wrestle with. That is that God's Spirit never stops hovering, never stops floating round about us, but God's Spirit is looking for those who will participate in that work. Those racist, evil men who planted a bomb in a church had decided that they would not cooperate with the Spirit of God. I am clear that when they bought the materials, Brother Tom, when they trafficked to the church, when they ignited the bomb, the whole time the Spirit of God was trying to blow them in another direction, but they insisted on their own way. Is there anybody here today that knows it not only works for them, but it works for us when God's Spirit is trying to get us to go in one direction, but we refuse and go in our own direction? Do I have any witnesses here today that God's Spirit has tried to blow you in another direction, but you had your own plan. You had your own dreams. You had your own stuff. You were unwilling to follow the wind of God. And here is my contention, that if God indeed is love, God's Spirit does not coerce us. God's Spirit does not force us. Love does not look like coercion or force. Love looks like partnership with the one who loves you. And the reason that they blew up that church is because they refused to be in partnership with God. They preferred to be in partnership with George Wallace and the White Citizens Council and the dear old philosophies and politics of Dixie. We must determine if we are willing to partner with God's Spirit when God's Spirit is trying to take us to places that we would rather not go. And so here we are in 2019, 400 years since 20 and odd Negroes landed right there near Hampton, Virginia. Now, you got to read Ivan Van Sertima, who said we came before Columbus. That's your reading assignment. But today, we will focus on 1619. My question is, where was the Spirit of God when these women and men were taken from their homes? Where was God's spirit when they traveled across waters that Genesis tells us that God brooded over then and God continues to brood over now? Where was God's spirit in the midst of the tragedy lifted up in our call to worship today? My contention this morning is that those who were captains and pilots of the ship determined that they would not follow the wind of God because profit was more important, because empire was more important, because expanding the power of the monarch of Great Britain was more important. They decided no to the spirit of God and yes to their own kingdom. And I want to lay bare today every human being, every government, every corporation that flies against the Spirit of God is under the judgment of God. And God does not forget those who fly against God's wind and destroying God's people. They decided themselves that they would not go in the direction of God's flapping beautiful wings, but they would do what it was that they wanted to do in spite of it. 
Now, here is what I want to share with you. I'm almost in my seat. I believe that God did not just create in Genesis 1, but God still creates. That creation is not a fixed moment in history, but God is still creating. Is there a witness here today that God didn't stop in Genesis, but God is still making all things new. God is still calling women and men into God's service. God ain't never stopped making new things and beautiful things and holy things because God is always in the business of creation. Is anybody here today who's willing to cooperate with what God is making, with what God is doing in the here and the now? Now watch what God did. The ones who came on that transatlantic voyage had difficulty. But God's Spirit helped them to create resistance. I need you all to know that we did not lie down and take it. But from the time we were transported, we were fighting back, doing whatever it took to be fully human on the land that God placed us upon. That we were resisting and then we turned all of the challenge and the pain into beautiful words and beautiful music and captivating art and captivating commerce. We took all of the pain under God's creation and turned it into something beautiful. Now I need to be careful here. I want you to be clear that God did not give us the pain so that we could create something beautiful. That when the pain came, God's spirit made something beautiful in spite of the pain. I'm here to tell somebody today, you are not where you are because God needs to teach you a lesson. God needs to bring you out of difficulty. You are where you are. So even in the midst of it all, God's spirit will create something new. And God will get the glory out of every tragedy, out of every difficulty, out of every broken moment. And so, if I've given you anything today, it is that we ought to find a way to allow ourselves to say yes to God's Spirit, to partner with the movement of God across the waters of our lives. And just one more thing. Uh, some years ago, I was on an airplane, and I walked on the plane. I, I boarded, and that's the technical term, I boarded, I boarded the plane. When I came into the plane, you know, they're tight quarters, and I'm nosy. Anybody here nosy? I'm nosy. And so, Mr. Jordan, I need to see who's flying the plane. I don't know about y'all, but not only do I pray for the pilot, but I need to see you. Because if you don't look right, I'm liable to get off the plane and to wait until someone whose spirit agrees with my spirit is flying me at 30,000 feet in the air. I walked past the cockpit, and I saw somebody who looked like my mama. And I said, I've been flying a long time, and I've seen pilots that look like Tom Cruise, and I've seen pilots that look like Richard Roundtree, but I ain't never seen a pilot that looked like Alfred Woodard and Viola Fisher and Ertha Lamar. Brother Garrett, I saw that pilot. I said, Lord, have mercy. I know I'm in good hands this morning. So I walked past the cockpit, and my body, because I felt like she was my mother, I just turned into the cockpit. And the, um, the flight attendant said, sir, where are you going? <laughs> And I said, ma'am, I'd like to speak with the pilot if I can. And she arranged it, and the pilot graciously allowed me into that tight space. Y'all ever been in the cockpit? You ever seen how tight? There she was, sitting in the pilot's seat with all of the instrumentation, her hat on, but her hair still bad, just kind of sneaking from underneath the cap, all looking good, talking in a sweet, dedicated, devoted way. And we talked and talked, and uh, she said to me, um, you know, with all of my training, with all of the years of my flying, we can't get where we need to go safely unless I follow the flight plan. I came to tell somebody here today that you're not going to get where God wants you to go if you follow your own flight plan. You're not going to reach the destination that God has for you if you follow 
your own flight plan. I wonder if there are just a few people here today that know you end up in some messes in your life because you followed your own flight plan. You, you followed your own direction. You followed your own dreams and your own goals. But do I have some counter witnesses here today who turned in your flight plan for God's flight plan and God did something amazing for you? Is there anybody here today who turned in your flight plan for God's flight plan and God did exceeding and abundantly more than you can ask, imagine, or dare to think. Is there anybody here today who turned in your flight plan and said, God, wherever you go, I'll follow. Wherever you lead, I'll follow. Wherever you take me, I'll follow. I'm convinced today that we've been here for 400 years still strong because we had enough mothers and fathers who turned in their flight plans and said, Lord, wherever you take us, we're willing to go, and we know you'll never leave us nor forsake us. So on today, I quote the great prophet Muddy Waters who said, I'm here. Everybody knows I'm here. Anybody know after 400 years, we're still here. After slavery, we're still here. After Jim and Jane Crow, we're still here. After the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, we're still here. After the bombing of churches, we're still here. The lynching of our mothers and fathers, we're still here. And we ain't going nowhere. We're staying under the protection of Almighty God. God's spirit is hovering today, and I want you to stand on your feet. Don't say nothing. Just do this. Remind yourself this week, when all hell is breaking loose on Monday, you sitting at your job, don't worry about what they think. Just stand up and do this. When you sit in a doctor's office and they tell you something you don't want to hear, don't worry about it. Say, Doc, excuse me for a minute. <laughs> when you hear about the next tweet fiasco down the road, the doors of the church are open. There is someone here today who needs to know that you are not alone. Someone here today who has never said, Lord, I yield. I want to be on your side and I want to follow your flight plan. Someone here who has never joined the church, who has never come to a body of believers, who has surrendered flight plans to follow the living God. If you do not have a church home, if you've never said, Lord, I want to live for you, and die for you. Would you come today as the choir sings?